back to my channel. It's your fave bookish tita, your tita Kate, and today I am relaunching my booktube. So I'm planning on posting this video live on December 31st, the last day of 2020, and basically this video is going to talk about the top 20 books that I read this year that were also published in, in 2020. But I also wanted to use this video to sort of announce that I would be relaunching or rebranding my booktube with the goal of being a little bit more purposeful of what I post on my YouTube. I don't want my booktube channel to just be full of hauls, TBRs. I want it to be more of a channel where you can go to get recommendations for different genres, different tropes or whatever, and even occasionally things like book reviews and bookish makeup looks and even journaling videos and things like that. I wanted my booktube to be a little more thoughtful, a little more insightful, rather than just being a repository for all of the books that I get in the mail, that I buy, that I receive as gifts from friends and loved ones. I also wanted to be a little more organized in terms of my schedule of uploading, so I am planning in 2021 that I will be regularly uploading videos once a week on Fridays. So hopefully I can stick to that schedule. And I'm also wanting or aiming to have more cohesive looking thumbnails and thumbnails that are a little bit nicer than what I usually do because usually I just like take a picture, slap a title on it, and then that's it. But I want my thumbnails to be a little bit more attractive, more interesting, more eye-catching so, you know, I can get some views. I also want to try to make my videos a little bit more accessible by using my local language a little bit more. So in the year or so that I've been on booktube, all of my videos have had me speaking in English. And that's not a bad thing. I am bilingual. I do uh, English is not my first language. As some of you can tell, sometimes there are moments where like I pause and I have to think about what I want to say because the first phrase or word that comes to my mind is Tagalog, which is my first language. So I thought I would sort of not do that anymore on my booktube videos. I mean, I would still make an effort to speak in English so that others who are not Filipino, who may not understand my language, can still watch and appreciate these videos. But if I feel like a concept is better explained in Tagalog or if my first thought to describe something about a book or whatever is in Tagalog, then I'm not going to stop myself. And one of my biggest goals really this year is to have a video where the language that I'm primarily using will be Tagalog. And of course, I'm going to subtitle it and include closed captions for users who don't speak Tagalog. But really, it's been a goal of mine for the longest time to have a video where I, you know, speak naturally, like how I would talk with friends who I meet here every day, my, my real life friends, my boyfriend, my family. So using that mix of Tagalog and English that leans more toward Tagalog. So I really want to have a video like that up on my channel. One of my inspirations in regard to that is the booktuber Gerald, who is one of my dearest friends, and he's completely unapologetic about the fact that he's a Filipino booktuber. His videos are frequently in Tagalog. The English is just, you know, peppered throughout there, but mostly his videos really are in our local language. And I really admire that about him. So it really is my goal this year to have a video where I only use Tagalog or primarily Tagalog. So I'm going to start working my way up to that video by not censoring myself when the first phrase that comes to my head is Tagalog. So I wanted to start off my rebrand of my booktube channel by bringing to you guys the 20 top books that I read in 2020. So these are all books that were published this year. I read this year and they absolutely blew my mind and made it to the top of my favorites list. This list is a mix of genres. Some of them are fantasy, some of them are mystery thrillers, but absolutely all of these books I rated five stars and I absolutely 100% loved them. I really highly recommend that if you haven't read these books yet, you really should go and get on it, get those books and enjoy.
First is one of my most recent reads, and that is Sweet on You by Carla de Guzman. This is honestly the first Christmas romance that I've ever read. And I really don't know why it took me so long to read Christmas romances. I mean, I love romance and I love Christmas as a holiday. So I really don't know why it took me a really long while to like, you know, patulan yung mga romance books na Christmas themed. But I'm glad that I finally did. I got this art from Carla and I absolutely freaking loved it. About these two small business owners who live in Lipa. It's a city in Batangas. One main character, Sari, is a coffee person. She owns a coffee house and like she's all about knowing the proper grind of a coffee, knowing how to brew and all of that. And the love interest is a baker who opens a bakery right next door to Sari's coffee shop. And it starts out as like a rivalry and then the rivalry sort of gets attention on social media. So both their stores become increasingly popular. And eventually, of course, they start feeling attraction for each other and falling in love with each other. But then the love that they have is sort of strained by the fact that the baker, our uh, main, our love interest Gab, the baker, actually has a deal to like open his bakery in a mall. And Sari, who is very vehemently against like, you know, malls and the stepping over of, of small businesses, finds herself like not agreeing with Gab's decision. So that's where the conflict comes in. This book is really, really cute. Like I said, it's a Christmas themed romance. It takes place around Christmas time and it features a lot of very distinctly Filipino Christmas traditions like the hanging up of the parol, which is a kind of star-shaped ornament, usually very huge, that Philippine families hang in their houses to celebrate Christmas. And then it also features Simbang Gabi, which is a religious practice where Filipinos attend mass for several days in a row. Uh, it also features Misa de Galio, which is where you attend mass also, but like at dawn. If Simbang Gabi is like late at night, Misa de Galio is early, really early in the morning. And then eating Christmas pastries like putobumbong and bibingka and all of that. And eating arroz caldo when you have just come home from Misa de Gallo. So it's got a lot of Filipino Christmas references. And, and honestly, this book single-handedly restored my Christmas spirit. Next, I've got two books here that were both published in 2020, but they're in the same series. And that is... The Wolf of Oranyaro and The Ikesar Falcon, both by K.S. Belioso. So The Ikesar Falcon is the sequel to The Wolf of Oranyaro. These books are basically set in a fantasy universe where it sort of asks the question, what if the Philippines was never colonized? So how would the government look? Would we eventually have become one country? All of that. So it's a fantasy retelling of that imagination of history. And the main character, Queen Talian, finds herself crowned the queen of Jin Sayang, but her husband has left her and he's run off to like her political enemies but she now but now she tries to bring him back for the sake of her son and of course the sake of her own feelings and it's a really really great exploration of both your identity as a woman and your relative place of privilege when you're part of the ruling class of a country so it's really really great i really really loved it it's so in-depth and if you're sort of aware of how the situation with farmers is going on in the Philippines. Like, farmers are always being abused here by the police, by the army. So these books really are a great way of looking at that. And that is not an accident because K.S. Villoso, the author, is Bicolano and, uh, and descended from a, far a traditional farming family. So she really put in the effort of like researching the nuances of that particular issue and you know writing it into a fantasy book. I cannot sing the praises of these two books enough. The last book in the trilogy comes out in 2021, in May 2021 I believe, and I am so freaking excited. I'm probably going to reread these books in January and in February just to prepare myself. Next on this list is Where Dreams Descend by Janela Angeles and I was really very very happy to have received an arc of this earlier this year. I remember that I really wasn't expecting to get it to be honest like I just sort of tweeted into the void oh hey I'd love it if I could get an arc of Where Dreams Descend never dreaming that I would actually get an arc but you know Janela Angeles and her wonderful team at Wednesday Books they really were determined to get this book into the hands of Filipino readers 
So they sent out RX, a bunch of us here, um, bloggers here in the Philippines were able to get RX. And I absolutely love the story. I loved it so much that I decided I was going to get myself a finished copy, not just an ARC. And this finished copy is actually also a birthday gift from a very good friend of mine. And I love this story so, so much. It's basically Moulin Rouge meets Phantom of the Opera meets the Night Circus. And it's all about a girl named Kalia who escapes the guy who has had like control over her life and her magic for the longest time. And she joins a magic contest, but only male magicians have ever joined that contest. So people are like, so of course the judges are like, oh, women can't join, women can't do like magic like this. They can only do domestic magic, but Kalia is determined to prove them wrong. And then in the course of the contest, there is a murder mystery that is going on. The writing was very descriptive and lush. So if you're not really too into like confusing twists and turns and prose that verges on being purple, you may want to give this book a skip. But if you're into that, if you're into like really decadent writing and plot that, you know, sort of really twists and turns and moves and doesn't really make sense at the first read, then definitely give this book a try. I really, really enjoyed it. Next on this list is Wicked As You Wish by Rin Chapeco. And I absolutely freaking love this, of course. I have not yet ever read a Rin Chapeco book that I didn't like. So like this book is not the first one that's going to be the first Rin Chapeco book that I didn't like. No, sir. And this book is basically a urban fantasy story sort of mishmash of a bunch of different fairy tales so you've got fairy tales like snow white cinderella and even legends like king arthur that are part of the story the snow queen all of that and basically it's about how magic is used the world over but the root is in a kingdom called avalon but the kingdom avalon is frozen until the heir to the throne can come back and sort of unfreeze it and in order to do that, he has to go on this magical journey with a bunch of companions. And his best friend is the other main character of this book, Tala, who is Filipino. And this is really the first book of Rin Chapeco's where she really sort of infuses it really with her Filipino identity. So this book is full of references talaga to what being Filipino is like. So you have food, familiar relationships, how you speak, how you talk, the words that you use, all of that. I really, really love it. Alam mo yung kitang-kita mo yung sarili mo in a book. And then, kitang-kita mo din yung mga kakilala mo in a book. It's, you really got that vibe from this from this book. Like, you feel seen. All of the aunts and uncles and all of the grandparents and then using words like tita and tito, lolo, lola, and all the food that, you know, you're used to. I really, really loved it. And this book also somehow manages to be like, an indictment of how the United States handles the immigration issue as well as being like a really cool fantasy story. So we love that. This year I also read A Song of Raids and Ruin by Roseanne A. Brown and this is one of my favorite debuts of this year. Um, the two main characters actually have to kill each other in order to get what they want but they find themselves falling in love with each other. And all of this takes place in the contest of the Solstasha Festival contest which takes place all the time in the Kingdom of Ziran. And all of this actually takes place in the context of a festival called the Solstasha, which has a contest which is pretty dangerous, so only champions who have proven themselves are supposed to be able to join. I really love this book. The world building is super, super lush. The stakes are told really well and really high. And the way that the two main characters begin to fall for each other despite, you know, the goal of both of them being to kill each other is actually really, really nice. I love it so much. I first read it as an ebook, but I adored it so much that I knew I had to get myself a physical copy. Speaking of stunning debuts, I also want to talk about Ray Bearer by Jordan Ifueco. This is one of the best, as in best, debuts I've ever read. And it really was just amazing. It was under like 400 pages. It was only like 380 something, I think. And yet the author was able to weave this very intricate, detailed world with such amazing legends and myths and systems in place. And the characters also are really great. So basically this book is about this girl named Tarisai and she is raised with only one purpose, which is to kill the crown prince. But then she actually gets to the palace and finds out that the prince is not a bad person. And she actually befriends him. The thing that I really love about this book is that it explores intergenerational trauma, as well as relationships, both romantic and platonic. Like, 
I absolutely love it when a book places like the same amount of emphasis on platonic relationships as it does romantic and this book really does that. It's so good and it's also a really interesting examination of the found family trope. So just if you haven't read Ray Bearer and if you've been seeing everyone singing this book's praises on your timeline, they're not wrong. This book is amazing. One of the most amazing books I've read this year. Get on it. And really, I cannot wait to see more from Jordan Ifuego. She is a rock star. She's going to knock this thing out of the park. I can't wait for both the sequel and for, you know, the rest of her books. Let's also talk about Incendiary by Zoraida Cordova. So this book is basically a revolutionary type of book where you have lucky rebels who try to overthrow this evil king. However, you have the main character who was actually raised by the evil king and he loved her, he cared for her deeply, and the rebels actually don't trust her because she has this very scary power while the king was the only one to ever treat her like her power was valuable. So I really love this book because it was really an interesting examination of privilege in the sense that you are a member of a community that is marginalized and oppressed, but you identify more with the oppressor because they're the ones who treat you well, whereas, you know, the people that you are supposed to identify with actually hate you and are angry with you. It's a really interesting examination of how to sort of reconcile the fact that your oppressor is the only one who, you know, is nice to you, but doesn't actually treat you like a human being. So there's that recognition of the difference between someone being nice to you just because you can do something good for them and someone actually recognizing your worth as an individual, which both sides in this case are guilty of doing. So I really adored this book and it ended on such a cliffhanger, my goodness. So I... I'm hoping to get the arc. I went into Zoraida's DMs, and I asked her if I could have an arc of the second book. And thank all the gods ever, she said yes. So I'm just waiting for the arc to arrive. So Philippine postal system, please be a pal. I also got myself a physical copy of Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno Garcia. This is a horror novel set in 1950s Mexico. It's basically got all of the things that make Gothic horror really cool. It's got a moldy, crumbling old mansion that's isolated in this super creepy, super far away town, and a plucky heroine who experiences like being gaslit and all, and is still trying to, you know, cut through all of that gaslighting and get to the truth. And one of the really creepy things about this book really is its portrayal of gaslighting. Like, you never really know if all of this really did happen to Noemi, the main character, or if, you know, she's hallucinating or dreaming or what, or you're also suspecting that the villains of this story are, you know, not on the up and up with her. But you never really know because it's all so unsure. And it's such a great portrayal of gaslighting for me. And aside from that, the imagery of this novel is really great. Like, I can really see it in my mind, the small town up in the mountains, that creepy old mansion. And then, of course, if you followed me on Twitter while I was reading this book or on Instagram, you already know that this book really is one of the proof positives that mushrooms are fucking creepy. Mushrooms are just not to be fucked with or trifled with in any way whatsoever. That is really just the main message of this book. All right, let's talk about some sequels. So I have some books on here that were sequels to books that were published earlier. And these books, the reason these books are on this list is because I feel that they were just as good, if not better, as the first book in that series. First, let's talk about We Unleash the Merciless Storm by Taylor Kimihia. And this is the sequel to the book, We Set the Dark on Fire. So it's another revolutionary book. This duology is FF Romance, which of course we adore. And the first book is from the POV of Danny. This one is from the point of view of Carmen, who as we find out by the end of We Set the Dark on Fire is actually a revolutionary agent and a spy from the organization known as Love Was, which is determined to bring down the dictatorship. Now, I really, really love this book. I feel it stood up to the first book because Carmen's voice is really intense in this one. You can really feel her passion for her people. And in the end, that's what I like about these stories of plucky rebels. I know some people prefer like the complex, complicated characters who have to undergo some kind of character growth before they care about a cause. I understand that. But personally, I absolutely freaking adore the people who are in the rebellion because they truly, truly believe in their people. They believe in freedom, in peace, in liberty, 
and they they believe in the safety of their people and you know their right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and all of that. I feel a little bit attached to this book because I can see the point of view of Carmen coming from someone who is also active in activism circles here in the Philippines. I'm not as active as I'd like to be, but you know, I do admire very much those people who are very gung-ho in their support for groups that are doing grassroots activism and, you know, groups that are standing up against the regime here in the Philippines. I really admire those people so much. So, like, I really can see where Carmen is coming from in this book. She's so intense about believing in freedom for her people and happiness and peace and prosperity. And I vibe with that. I really honestly vibe with that. So I really appreciated this book and where it was coming from. And that's why I think it really, you know, stood the test of being able to stand up to the first book in the duology. I also really liked The Silvered Serpents by Roshni Chokshi, which is the sequel to The Gilded Wolves. I adored The Gilded Wolves. I adored The Silvered Serpents. And it's also a heist book, just like The Gilded Wolves is. But the reason why I love this more than The Gilded Wolves is to me the heist plot here made more sense and also the villain reveal was like it really had that wham factor whereas for me the villain reveal in The Gilded Wolves was kind of like eh, who the hell is this guy? Where the fuck did he come from? So it kind of really didn't make a big impact for me but the villain reveal in here for me was flawless, meticulous, I loved it and then the twist ending also for me just really did it. I feel like the twist here was a lot better done like the groundwork was laid for it whereas the twist in the gilded wolves really just came out of nowhere so i like this book a lot because i feel like you could see that roshni chokshi was getting a feel really for the universe of this series and i cannot wait for the next book i also have here iron heart by nina varela and this is the sequel to the book uh crier's war so in this universe you have two kinds of people i guess which is the otoma who are like created through alchemy and then humans. And the Otama have enslaved the humans and basically turned them into servants. Now the humans are like fighting back. And this duology, Cryer's War and Iron Heart, is about an Otama falling in love with a human. I really like this book because it also really showed that, you know, when you're talking about a revolution, it doesn't have to be all, always this huge thing where it's always about fighting and battles and those really big important significant scenes it can also be about the smaller things that people do that contribute to that revolution so i really really liked it and also this book for me really did well in portraying platonic relationships like we still get lots of like really lovey-dovey sweetheart type of scenes with isla and crier don't get me wrong but we also get to see crier the otama who's been sequestered away from like society for most of her life being the daughter of the sovereign being a princess we also get to see her really interact with other people and realize that you know on her own she is worthy of having friends she is worthy of being liked and loved just for who she is as a person and not just as a sovereign's daughter so we love that and then my favorite sequel of 2020 was another Rin Chopeco book and this is the ever cruel kingdom like I said by Rin Chapeco. This is the sequel to The Never Tilting World. And basically, if the Never Tilting World sort of hinted at like inspiration of climate change and how the planet is being destroyed, the Ever Cruel Kingdom really just smacks you with that analogy. And basically it's all about how, like, you know what, if you don't want to save the world, if you don't want to help people, we'll do it ourselves. It's kind of like very that in that the younger generation is like, you know what? Kung hindi nyo kaya, kung ayo nyo sige kami na lang bahala kayo. It's very that. And it also really explores for me intergenerational trauma and just trauma in general. And one of my favorite things about this duology is that it doesn't shy away from portraying mental illness, especially PTSD. And it flat out cites therapy as a very good way of, you know, handling your PTSD. And I feel like conversations like that should be normalized in fantasy. You never know who could be helped by seeing those topics discussed on the pages of a book. So I really appreciated both The Never Tilting World and The Ever Cruel Kingdom for doing that. And then, my God, you guys, this book is hella gay. Everyone in this book is gay in some way. We have, of course, we have sapphic representation in the form of Lana Nodessa, who, by the way, is bodyguard romance, so we love that. We also have ace and arrow representation. We have more bisexual representation. So we love it. And also this book is really heavy on themes of like 
communication and how most problems can be solved if you guys had just talked to each other from both small things like relationships to big things like government and policy. So I love that. I cannot sing this book's praises enough. That is it for the physical copies that I have of my top 20 books of 2020. Let's move on to the ebooks. First ebook that I'm going to talk about, although I do have a physical copy on its way, I just haven't gotten it yet in the mail, but this is These Violent Delights by Chloe Gong which is a retelling of Romeo and Juliet set in 1920s Shanghai. And Romeo and Juliet in this retelling are the heirs to rival gangs. And these gangs are the White Flowers and the Scarlet Gang. I really, I really loved the portrayal of not just the romance because they're yearning. Oh my god, Chloe Gong is a master at writing yearning. Like I could feel it deep in my heart. But also the way it talks about, you know, the history of China, of 1920s China and colonization. It was just really, really well done. And it also has like this very creepy vibe because um, aside from being rival gangsters, Roma Montagov, the heir to the White Flower Gang, and Juliet, the heir to the Scarlet Gang, they also now have to deal with like, there's like this virus that's ravaging Shanghai and they have to put aside their differences to try and figure out what is going on. So the part about the virus was really creepy. Honestly, pro tip, when you read these violent delights, like take a shower beforehand, make sure you're clean, you're gonna want it. Trust me. Next is a book that is also still in transit and on its way to me, and this is Blaze Rat Games by Amparo Ortiz. And this book is basically like a sports book but with dragons, which I love. All sports books should have dragons. The main character of this book wants to play Blaze Wrath, which is her favorite game to watch and to play. And it's basically like, I hate to use a Harry Potter reference, but it's basically like if Quidditch were played with dragons. Now, she does make it to her country's national team, but then there's like a conspiracy to end Blaze Wrath and just dragons in general, and she has to solve that conspiracy or else she and her team might actually end up dying or getting into really big trouble or injured or whatever. And it was just really well written. It's like how classic sports YA would be, but like, you know, add dragons. And it's also very Puerto Rican. So I, I can't speak to the Latinx representation because I'm not Latinx, but there are so many people who have said that, you know, as a Puerto Rican, this book really meant a lot to them. So I'm very happy to see that it filled that need. Okay, so you know what, these next two books, so that I don't have to say it at the beginning of every time that I talk about it, but these next two books, I also have physical copies in transit headed my way. I just haven't, they just haven't arrived yet. So yeah. The first one is The Burning God by R.F. Kuang, and this is the end to the Poppy War trilogy. This book just broke my heart. I don't want to talk about it too much because I don't want to spoil people who haven't read it yet and people who haven't read yet The Poppy War of the Dragon Republic. Just, you know, suffice it to say, it was very painful and I wasn't prepared for it. I thought I was. I thought I was prepared for pain. I thought I was ready for my faves to die. But, you know, this book really just proves that no matter how much you prepare for something that you think is going to be painful, sometimes there really is just no preparation for something that painful. This next book is The Silence of Bones by Jun Her, and, and this is a mystery thriller set in ancient Korea, which at the time was called Joseon. And the main character is basically a type of servant to the police who handles the bodies if the females were victim because, because of the strict rules at the time, male detectives, male policemen couldn't be the ones to like handle female bodies. So these were the ones who handled that. And basically she's trying to solve this mystery and it seems as if the evidence is all pointing to the one detective who she likes on the force because he's the only one who treats her like a person. He's the only one who's decent to her and isn't, you know, a bully. So she's now struggling what to do with that evidence when it seems like this one person that she actually really likes and cares for is seems like they're the killer. So I really like The Silence of Bones. Not only was it super atmospheric, it really made you feel like you were there, like in Joseon, Korea. Like, it really made you feel like you were watching a K-drama, to be honest. Mystery itself was written really well. When the villain is revealed, you don't feel like it came out of nowhere. The breadcrumbs were laid nicely. And when you find out who the real killer is, it's more of this like, aha, I knew it! Rather than like, where the fuck did that come from? Or like, or if you didn't see it coming, it feels satisfying. It's like, oh, I didn't see that coming! 
oh nga no, why didn't I think of that? Because you're like connecting all of the dots that the author sprinkled throughout the book rather than it coming out of nowhere. So I really appreciate it when mystery writers do that, when they leave clues so that if you don't figure it out at the end when the person reveals themselves, you can sort of go back and see like, oh yeah, this is an indicator that this guy was the villain and all of that. So I really love it when mysteries and thrillers do that. And I believe that June Hur did a really good job with The Silence of Bones in this particular context. And then of course, I have said this so many times, I really love historical fiction that doesn't involve white people and it doesn't take place just in the United States or in Europe. I really love historical fiction that takes place in other countries and features um, characters of color and is of course is also written by authors of color. So I love that for The Silence of Bones. Speaking of mystery thriller and horror, I also really enjoyed The Only Good Indians and this book is basically like a supernatural horror story about this group of kids who go on a hunting trip and they kill an elk and then when they get older they become adults the spirit of the elk actually haunts them and this book is like super creepy the author is so good at like really writing really making his writing in such a way that when you read certain phrases or certain paragraphs the hair on your arms or on the back of your neck really stands on end like this book really creeped me out I read it at night, which I deeply regret. Like, it just really gave me the heebie-jeebies so badly. So that was my fault. <laughs> but there were so many portions of the book where you read it and you were like, okay, that's fucked up, that's creepy. Ayoko na. Ganong vibe. So just in terms of atmosphere, this book was really, really well done. There were certain aspects of Native American culture that I had to, like, stop and look up. Like, there was a portion of the book where basketball is, like, really super emphasized. And I didn't get it until I looked it up, but like basketball is like a really big deal on reservations in Native American communities. We have that in common. Basketball is a big thing here in the Philippines too. If there are certain portions of the book that you don't get, I really would advise, you know, looking it up. If it's part of looking it up as part of Native American culture and doing like your research or looking into it before writing something completely off first. Because this book is really written you really get the vibe from this book that it was really written with a native american audience in mind and you have to keep that in mind if there's parts about the book that you don't understand honestly just this book was just really good it was really spine tingling skin crawling every description that you can think of like this existential dread type horror the only good indians really was able to master that and just so that i don't end this video talking about creepy books let me also talk about the last two books on my list which are both romances and the first one is Keeping Miss Kalila and this is a second chance romance about a couple who broke up and then get back together but when they get back together the guy finds out that the girlfriend has gotten pregnant through IVF and she just really wants to have a child even though she doesn't have a man in her life and this is one of like the only pregnancy involved romances that I read that didn't make me cringe from the misogyny it was really well done in my opinion it had so many sweet nakakakilig moments. This is also like one of the books in Tara Frejas' series that involves the Alves brothers. The first one being like Nobody's Watching, which is one of my favorite romance novels of all time. So if you're into respectful men who don't, you know, push the women that they love into anything that makes them uncomfortable, then definitely check out Keeping Miss Kalila and also like Nobody's Watching. And lastly is the book You Had Me at Ola. I really love this book. It's basically about these um, telenovela stars who end up falling in love with each other as they play a couple on their TV show, which is going to be turned into like a streaming TV show put on a streaming platform rather than just your regular telenovela. And I really, I have a soft spot for telenovelas, you guys. Like, they really were the TV that I would come home to from school and watch because that's what would be playing at that time of the day. I really loved it. We had like local versions of all of the classics. We had a local version of um, Rosalinda and Talia and Marimar and all of that. So I really loved getting to see it in a book form. And I really also loved all of the representation. It was a very unapologetically Latinx book. It also tackles issues like attachment or abandonment issues as well as PTSD. And like some of my favorite books ever, this book also really explicitly gives out therapy as a way of dealing with these issues. That is it. That is my top 20 for 2020. If you've read any of these books, 
leave a comment tell me what you thought if you haven't read any of these books yet but you do want to also leave me a comment if you want to talk about what you read this year what you really enjoyed this year leave me a comment i would love to chat don't forget tomorrow my new self-hosted website launches so i am now at yourtitakate.com i no longer use a WordPress free account. I have officially gone self-hosted. I have a domain and everything. I am so excited to show you guys what the website will look like, all of the new content that I've planned for my new blog. So I hope you guys support it. I hope you guys support me. I will leave the link to my new blog in the description box below. Go check it out. My first post goes live January 1, 2021, 8 a.m. GMT plus 8 like the dramatic bitch that I am. Thanks for watching this video. Don't forget to hit like, subscribe, click the little notification bell to get notified every time I post a video. And I will see you next time. Stay fresh. Love from your Tita Kate. Hey.